Uh, innovation's missing piece. I'm going to talk to you about this idea that um, innovation is missing something. So the interesting thing about that prop, everyone presumes it's the piece which is missing. I'm actually going to show you that it's the gap, that hole which is missing. So I'm going to start off with a story. Um, this is actually one of the first um, processes of an invention which uh, somebody started documenting. It's actually a very um, uh, famous mathematician, Henry Poincaré. Um, he was very self-aware. So not only did he come up with a great invention, uh, he solved a really complex mathematical problem, probably many of them in his lifetime, but he actually described one in fairly vivid detail. He did talks in Paris, and he actually included it in one of his books. So it actually starts off with a, a two-week period where he's trying to solve this problem. He's talking about, he's trying to solve the problem that fusion functions don't exist. You don't have to worry about the mathematics of it, but he's trying to solve this problem that these class of functions don't exist. He spends about two weeks, and he's really struggling with it. One night, he drinks a little bit of coffee. Okay, that's a tick for, you know, for mentioned coffee. <laughs> French, I'm going, to, I'm going well here. Uh, <laughs> so he drinks a cup of coffee, and he has a sleepless night. And he wakes up, and these ideas are bubbling around. Unfortunate for him, what he actually comes up with is actually an example of that function. So he's blown his whole theory, he's frustrated. He doesn't actually get to work on it much because he's actually going off on a trip. So there's actually a couple of weeks he's actually um, you know, on this geologic, geology trip. And he actually comes up with the greatest idea which solves the biggest problem for him just about as he's about to step on this bus. He's in mid-conversation, he's a polite man, he doesn't actually stop the conversation, but the idea comes to him completely formed. I mean, that was the thing which really blew him away. This idea that, you know, this thing he'd been sol you know, working on for a long time, he hadn't thought about it in weeks, he's on vacation, kind of, and it suddenly comes to him. He was, he was kind of like, he went back to the hotel, he works on it, proves that the idea is actually valid. He realizes that these fusion functions are actually based on Euclidean, Euclidean geometry, which solves a huge problem in his uh, mathematical field. He goes on over the next few months, and he goes through these periods of intense work, but the ideas come to him when he's in the, in the strangest of places. It actually comes to him one time he's walking on the beach, and another piece of the puzzle falls into place. Then he actually has to go to military service. You know, this is a mathematician, he's a military service, probably doesn't have much time to do math, and the last piece of the puzzle comes in. This is actually an earth-shattering mathematical discovery he had, but the best thing about it was he described it. He, could, he was self-aware, and he could think through his invention process. That's actually a better service to us than actually the mathematics he actually came up with. So, one of the things which he was part of was um, a, a survey which went out to mathematicians and scientists around that time. Einstein was involved in it. Um, famous mathematicians from around that time period. And it was by Jacques Hadmard. And he was compiling this idea of the invention process. So he looked at scientists and mathematicians because he seemed to be the greatest you know, source of solving complex problems. His work in that little, it's a tiny little book, it's really worth reading if you can get a hold of it, it's the, is solves the problem of how we go through the invention process. His book led to you know, Wallace writing actually this process, these four steps. And it turned into a lot of what we call invention process today. You know, um, the brainstorming by Alex Osborne came from some of this research. Um, the Art of Thought, you know, there's a number of books through the 50s, um, um, and it really came to solving this problem of how do we come up with ideas. But something's got lost in the translation, and what I believe's got lost is actually step two. Can anybody tell me what do you think step two is? Any ideas? Kind of. Incubation. It's a specific term, right? But it's the idea of relaxing. This idea of hard work combined with these periods where these ideas come to you. This is actually taken from a survey by Idea Champions uh, where they polled hundreds of people, creative people, 
where they got their best ideas. And the interesting thing about this poll was the majority of ideas, if you actually aggregated the, the data, was more than 90% of the ideas came when you weren't at work. To the point, people come up with more ideas lying in bed than at work. So this is, a, this is what I explain to my wife when I want to take a nap. You know, I'm working on something, OK? <laughs> so we have this concept that incubation is really important. But why aren't we doing it? We, a, we don't understand it very well. So obviously, the, a lot of the stuff in neuroscience these days has started coming up with these ideas, understanding how our brain works. We're only conscious of a small percentage of our thoughts. The rest of them, you know, the rest of your brain is working on things constantly which you're not aware of. They don't bubble up there. So this idea that you know, a fully formed idea can bubble up from your brain and you're conscious of it suddenly is something which we feel uncomfortable with. To the point, this is something I've known about for about 15 years. I still struggle daily with walking away from a problem and incubating it because it feels so passive. The last piece of this was some research I was doing in behavioral economics. George Lowenstein came up with this idea of information gaps. So it's the motivation for curiosity. It's what drives us to seek out new information. I presume most Tedsters have a, a you know, abundance of this, is this idea that information gaps, when you give somebody a question, they want to close that information gap. They want to answer that question. Great authors, you know, page-turning authors, right? What makes you turn those pages? These are people who've mastered information gaps. They create questions. Who is the murderer? Why is the detective doing this? What has that clue got to do with it? You know, it suddenly draws you through. Uh, in my talk I gave in DC, I talked about the Da Vinci Code. It's a page-turning book. Dan Brown is the master of creating these little information gaps which drags you through. And the interesting thing about information gaps is this is part of the puzzle which drives us to solve problems. Why did your brain keep working on a problem when you walked away from it? It's to do with the fact that there's an unanswered question. I've been thinking about this for a long time. So this is my first incubation around this. I was like, all right, incubation's important, right? So why aren't people doing it? I mean, the first answer came pretty quickly. Uh, this is a sign I used to put on my desk or my door when I'm working on something, you know, do not disturb, I'm incubating, right? But this is, the, this is what people think I was doing, you know. So this idea that it's hard to convince your boss. Like, tell your boss that I'm going to incubate on this problem. It's passive. You know, as American culture, I, even come, I come from England, it's still the same concept. This idea of something which is passive is something which goes against our Protestant work ethic, right? If you're working on something, you should be working. There should be sweat. There should be, you know, labor here. Uh, this idea that you're incubating an idea seems to be very foreign. The next thing is something which Steve Johnson talked to Ted Global about, the slow hunch. Right? He talks about Darwin, he talks about a few other examples, but this idea that Darwin worked on the theory of evolution for years. I mean, there's a period of about 15 months where he's actually working on this intensely. The idea comes to him while he's reading an article about Malthus, uh, about population, sorry, by Malthus. And if you look back through his note, I mean, Johnson's book, you know, Where Ideas Come From, actually goes into it a little bit more. His thoughts around this, he had all the pieces. They just weren't coming together. So this idea of incubation is something which is, you know, it takes a long time. I mean, if you think about uh, DNA, Crick and Watson, that's about two years. Two years they struggled with that problem. Other people were still struggling with it. They solved it in two years. That's actually pretty remarkable. The post-it note, the most famous invention, innovation example which we talk about, actually took about six years. Uh, Edison with his light bulb, if you really look at when he started working, about 12 years. So these things take a long time. So people have this tendency to, like, not only is it hard to convince your boss you're going to incubate, you're doing this thing which is passive, this could take years. Academia is very open to this idea that you could be researching something, solving something over a long period of time. The business world, not quite so open to this idea, right? You know, I, I tried to put that in on project plan once as a joke to my manager. There's a little period of incubation which lasted 18 months. Yeah, he wasn't, it wasn't flying. <laughs> So the last piece of it is the flip side of the motivation around information gaps. What drives you to close those gaps is part motivation, so it fires your motivational circuits,
but it's part fear. The fear of the unknown, the fear of ambiguity. It's actually something which is, draw, you know, it's something in our heritage from when we were mammals. Fear of unknown is something which they've tested in mammals all the way up to humans and realized that there's this idea that you know, we, w we don't like the unknown and we'll constantly work to you know, close those information gaps. So it's people don't like gaps. You know, it's a long way down, right? So coming, bringing all of these things together, I was like, all right, so I understand why you know, incubation isn't very popular in the everyday. I can understand why Alex Osborne kind of just missed it, like the idea of brainstorming, creativity in the workplace. You know, let's just skip over that bit which nobody's really going to buy. Let's try and do these brainstorming sessions. I was actually working on a creativity game. It's a brainstorming game, and I've been working on it for a number of years, and I play tested it. It was a game mechanic I was trying to fine tune. I worked on this for about two years, play testing with group after group after group. One of the things I found was, it was actually a fairly reliable thing. One week after a playtesting session, I would be guaranteed to get an email, a phone call, about an idea which we were playing around with in the game, which had solved the business problem they were working on, or this idea for a product, or something actually turned into a company from one of these sessions. So I was like, hang on a minute. One week? That's all you need? One week can solve this problem of incubation? Obviously, we're not going to be coming up with the ideas of DNA or evolution, but guess what? We've come up with something which is a little bit more manageable. So I went back to the story of Point Carry. What did he do? He iterated between periods of deep thought and periods of relaxation. You know, this idea of think, incubate, think, incubate. Can we actually put that in a process? So I actually came up with this, what I call Thinkubate, which is basically taking that process which Wallace had come up with and actually putting incubation back into it in an iterative process. So just, I mean, when I, we go and do this with companies, all we do is, all right, all you need to do is instead of one brainstorming session, we're going to have a second brainstorming session one week later. Much easier to convince your boss than 18 months of incubation, but it actually improves the quality of ideas quite significantly. So the last period of my work, I've really been thinking about the last few years since we released that, we've been thinking about how do we improve incubation. So I've done this talk many times, and I've come up with three tips to leave you with. The first one comes around the first question you get when you talk about incubation of people. People think procrastination, right? You're taking a nap. Well, well we've shown that taking a nap actually could help, but you know, this idea that procrastination. So Mark McGuinness had this great little quote which I saw, which was, procrastination happens before hard work, Incubation happens after hard work. You need to have immersed yourself in a problem. You need to make yourself care. So this idea which George Lowenstein talked about information gap, the key thing he says if you want to design a gap, what these page learning authors give you is they make you care about the characters and the story. So you need to care about the problem enough for your brain to keep working on it. So the first one is that. It's just hard work before incubation. The next one is actually, I don't know if many of you have read, um, you know, Hemingway's you know, his, his autobiography of his time in Paris in the 20s as a young man. But he has this great, he was, he was writing, he was uh, mixing with a lot of writers at the time. But one of the things from that period, he talks about this idea of walking away from the writing desk when he still has ideas to write. And this trying kind of triggered for me this idea that he's basically creating gaps for himself. Because what's more frustrating than not being able to close that gap? You can't write it down. I don't know if you're familiar with David Allen's Getting Things Done, a great time management book. He talks about open loops, this idea of time management. And he comes up with this idea that things which aren't done create open loops in your head. Oh, I haven't done the gardening. I have to mow the lawn. I have to do the washing. I have to take my car to the car wash. You know, All these things sit in your head and go round and round and round. The to-do list is a really simple way of getting it just out of your head. If anybody's created a to-do list, it closes that gap because it's somewhere there. Your brain doesn't have to keep worrying about it. What I'm suggesting is when it comes to problems or things you want to create, create those gaps. Turn, turn a, something into a question. Actually create the gaps. Actually go around you know, this idea of opening gaps up. In our, 
in our work with customers, we have this period where we call divergent thinking. And through that, we're constantly creating questions for the customer. So this idea of brainstorming session one week, followed by a second brainstorming, what we walk out the door with the first week is a set of questions. We don't come up with that list of three ideas which would make your boss happy and prove that it was a worthwhile session. We actually come up with questions we haven't answered because I want people to keep thinking about it. And this comes to the last one. So this idea that we don't like gaps, we artificially close gaps all the time. So the hardest thing which we have when we're talking about this process, we're saying to this customer, we want you to stay in divergent mode of thinking we're not going to converge. We understand your desire to. And we've had people squirming in their seat trying to write, and they'll write things down in their notebooks because we won't let them write on the whiteboard these ideas or thoughts. But the people who actually follow through, it creates the gaps and it creates great ideas. So basically, the last idea I want to give you is don't close gaps artificially. Keep them open past a point of discomfort, and you can come up with some great ideas.